Hey guys, this is Frank Decker, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overeem. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. DJ Dillashaw. You're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio, episode 181. It's the 6th of March. Dennis Skradov here with Kasper Rozalowski with another action-packed, fun-sized, fun-sized episode of Submission Radio for all the fans at home, Cass, all the listeners, all the friends, all the family that tune into the program. Man, am I excited for the show this week, Cass? We have one hell of an episode. I'm excited as well. You mentioned it, fun-sized. We've got three guests, not too long, not too short. As uh, as Goldilocks would say, it's just right. It's just <laughs> just the just the right amount. Got a good friend Bass Rutten coming back on the program. Man, it has been a while since we've spoken to Bass Rutten. Can never get enough of that man in my life. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure you guys feel the same way because every time we get Bass Rutten on the show, people love it. And uh, he's doing this whole detached challenge at the moment, where he's basically detached from from most media and a whole bunch of things. But he's kind enough to give the boys some time. We know we watch UFC 235, so. He's in the loop, and we can't wait to have him on the program and talk fights with him. I'd love to talk to him about uh, Macy Barber coming on the show for the first time ever. The future, they call her. She's made a huge splash at strawweight, saying that she'll be the next big star, bigger than Conor McGregor, bigger than Ronda Rousey. She's got a fight coming up against JJ Aldridge later this month, moving up to flyweight. There's a lot to talk to her about. We want to get the story out. We want to talk to her, get to know her. Find out how and when she got into MMA at just 20 years old at the moment, making a massive splash in the UFC. Wants to beat John Jones's record. She was at UFC 235. John Jones was at UFC 235. Her teammate Anthony Smith. So much to talk to Macy about. So I'm really excited to get her on the show for the first time. And of course, speaking of friends of the program, Luke Thomas coming on the program to discuss UFC 235 and a whole bunch of other things. You're right, man. It is fun size. I am excited. Yeah, I mean, so much so much stuff to talk about. And a quick reminder for everybody at home, if you guys haven't checked us out, jump on social media and give us a follow or your like or your follow, I guess, if it's Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, make sure to jump on. You can DM us, you can message us, you can retweet us, you can like us, you can comment underneath, give us your thoughts on the episode. Obviously, this is on YouTube as well. If you are listening on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, well, this this episode is up on YouTube, so if you haven't subscribed, jump on subscribe. There's video elements to all these interviews, so you guys will be able to check out or recheck out an interview if you want to see what the person looks like, if you want to see what kind of fun top, fun hat, whatever is going on in the background behind us on the show, you guys can check that out on YouTube, so make sure to jump on and subscribe. And a quick reminder, if you guys haven't checked it out, Masashi is our sponsor to help us get overseas and cover events for you guys make sure to check out their products they're some of the best of course i always talk about those protein wafers cast delicious you guys can check those out in stores close to your online but with that with that you mentioned it it's a fun size show i can't wait to get into it some first times on submission radio some old friends coming back one of those old friends is on the line and cast i believe you're about to introduce him all right, guys. Our next guest is arguably the busiest man in MMA. You know him from his work on MMAfighting.com, the Luke Thomas show, the MMA beat, and of course, now the MMA hour. Luke Thomas himself. Welcome back to the program. How are you, man? Good, boys. How are you? Thank you for having me. Uh, very good. And thank you for joining us. You guys, Casper mentioned, one of the busiest guys going around. We want to kick things off, Luke, by talking about a fight that's just looking like it's about to be confirmed. Alex Volkanovsky versus Jose Aldo. It's a fight that a lot of Australian fans and New Zealand fans are pretty happy about, but obviously there's a little bit of backlash coming out from other fans that don't really know much about Alex. What do you make of the fight being put together? Man, this is going to be one where you're going to get, I think, a lot of different answers depending on who you ask, which, of course, is true of any question, but especially in this case. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is to say, I think a lot of people who are concerned about the featherweight division are rightly going to note, it's like, are you really going to send Aldo to go beat Stevens? And then Moicano, and then maybe Volkanovski. Obviously, Volkanovski is a talented fighter, but let's say Aldo wins. You just killed off three potential contenders. What the hell are you doing? I understand that argument. I honest to God, I do. But I have to tell you, I kind of love it. To, to be to be fair, it's going to be in Brazil, which whenever Jose Aldo fights there, it's like you finally get to know what it's like. Um, you get to fully take in the Jose Aldo experience only in Brazil. Number one. Mm. Number two, Volkanovski versus Aldo no matter what side of the equation you fall on, is just a great fight. So there's that as well. And then I think three, and most importantly, like 
Alex might win. I'm not suggesting to you that he won't. It's a very competitive fight. But for Aldo to end up finishing his career, I think he's got two more fights left. And to be like, you know what? All right, I lost to Max twice. I'm going to get out there, and I'm just going to beat all of these contenders one by one. And he stopped Jeremy Stevens, and then he stopped Hanato Moicano. And we'll see what happens against somebody as talented as Volkanovski. But if he beats him, I'm not saying that it doesn't create problems for the featherweight division and Max going up to 155, and there's a mess that could happen. <laughs> but I love the guts that it shows that this guy has – to line up the toughest fights he can get in his weight class at the time rather than some vanity fights mm. for maximum pay-per-view exposure. I love that he is doing that. It is so awesome for me to see. And I'm not saying it doesn't come without costs. I'm just telling you I love it. It's true because a lot of fighters sort of towards the tail end of their careers, A, they don't look as good as Aldo, and B, they take on, I guess, somewhat lesser opponents. Well, like you mentioned, Volkanovski is one of the top guys. He's uh, He is a contender in the division. Just wondering, are you surprised that there isn't some kind of interim belt added to the equation here? And, I, and I'm not saying that there should be, but with, with Max's absence, and to put it in perspective, we had Brett Okamoto, I believe, last week, and he said, look, don't strip Max yet. Give him the opportunity to at least defend his belt, and you don't really know how, how things are going to go in lightweight. But are you surprised the UFC in this case didn't jump the gun and say, you know what, we'll just give an interim belt to these guys? Because um, I, I think in some ways you can say they deserve it. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is I'd probably echo Brett's point. First of all, Poirier might win, number mm. one. Uh, number two, but let's say Max does, what does that mean? Yeah, I think you give him a shot, but then you have to make a choice, right? So my point to you is your question is, your question is, are you surprised they didn't create one now? No, but if you ask, like, in other words, it's still a near foregone conclusion that they might right after the fight or something. Like, they might find some way to figure out that the winner of this fights, I don't know, who else, someone else in that division for the interim belt. So, so no, but I think that, like, depending on how things shake out, if Max wins and if and if Aldo wins, then they well, even if Aldo loses, they might find ways to do it. So it seems eminent if Max if Max wins. Mm. Just while we're on the lightweight division, it seemed like uh, Cowboy Cerrone and Conor McGregor were going to have this fight, and now Dana is saying, "No, nah, it's not going to happen," which could almost be a sign that it's definitely going to happen, or could <laughs> be a sign that something else is going to happen. It's, it's hard as MMA media to try and read the lies that Dana White sometimes throws at us at these press conferences, but. Let's say it doesn't. He was doing an interview with Brett Okamoto where he brought up Conor McGregor's name with Khabib. He said, oh, Conor McGregor wants to fight Khabib. So in saying that, if Khabib comes back in November, right now, in your mind, who do you think is going to be versing Khabib? Do you believe it's going to be the winner of this interim fight? Do you believe the UFC are doing the old one-two and trying to get the big payday with another Conor McGregor fight? What do you think happens here? Luke? God. <laughs> that is... <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I don't even know what to say. Uh, there should under no circumstances be a rematch. I mean, I've made this point before. Uh, so, so we just talked about it. Poirier is going to fight, uh, Max Holloway for the second time. They first fought in 2012. Uh, that's the same year that Tony Ferguson last lost in. Right. It's been that long. And people are out there being like, wow, I was so, that fight was such a long time ago, man. Uh, you know, they're so different now. I mean, think about how much their careers have uh, changed. You know, the, by the way, their first meeting and that loss from uh, Max are only two months apart. Just two months apart. That's it. And they both took place in 2012. Wow. Dude, it, it's, it's like, what does a guy have to do to get one? And I get, oh, we're trying to maximize money. It's the WME way. I mean, to go over and I you're like oh he should have taken the interim title bout why why should he have taken it because you should just give in to a totally broken and capricious way of doing matchmaking because that's the way to do things like I recognize sitting out is also full of peril and that could go poorly for him but at the same time it's like why should he do something to earn what he what he's earned seven times over it's just absurd to think about how he could be passed over for anybody at this point. And I know the UFC tried to make that fight a gazillion times, but you got to keep trying if, as long as this is the guy in front of you and ready to make it. So who is uh, Habib going to fight next? I honestly would not be surprised if it's Connor, especially if they put it in New York City, to be quite honest with you. But I'm, gonna, I'm going to remain cautiously optimistic and say it's going to be the winner of that interim. About, especially I think what they really want to do is 
I think that they want to do Habib Holloway. I think they're itching for that. Yeah. They really like that idea. Can't when they tried close. to make it the first time when, when Tony fell through, mm. I think they want to run that one back. Mm, absolutely. I'm just wondering because obviously at, at the press conference for UFC 236, Dana White was sort of talking about, hey, these guys are up here because they took our phone call and they were available when we called. So they're fighting for the titles. What is your thought on? I feel like things are switching a little bit. And in, in, in Melbourne, there was a media member that kind of gave it back to him and was trying to in the press conference. I don't know if you saw up the UFC 235. He was actually going for it. This is a guy that you know covers things locally. And I, I, afterwards, I said, "Good on you, man. Good on you for actually speaking your mind." But what do you think of the landscape that we're in right now, where we sort of went from okay, the number one contender gets the shot to okay, the biggest star jumps over everyone. And then gets the shot to now, if you're not available on four weeks' notice and maybe you had a nose surgery, you get passed up and then you don't get another title shot. You have to be available, basically, Luke. Otherwise, you yeah, don't get it's, it. Yeah, it's like uh, sand going through your hands. So it's like <laughs> if you carry it, it's like, do you have sand in your hands? Yes. But there's a time on that. You know, it's, so, so it's not really – you don't really have a title. A title confers upon you something. If the title can expire – not naturally, but whenever they want it to expire, if they cannot affirmatively grant you status, what is the title? It, it, it's, it only means something in as much as they want it to mean. And again, that could be true of almost anything, but they simply, there are some guardrails that they're pretty protective about as it relates to the natural title itself, but the interim one, the guard, there's no guardrails anymore. Um, so you could say, well, if past is prologue, then they'll make sure that the winner of Max versus Poirier gets it. But like, honestly, I, I had this debate with Danny Segura, and I know a lot of people disagreed with me, and, and some agreed with me. It was people, some people were split to a degree, but a lot of people pushed back against me, and they're like, okay, it doesn't guarantee you anything, but that's what they've done historically. Great. That's what they've done historically. They also, in recent history, have eroded and eroded and eroded and eroded all of those practices. What is to deny them anything about putting McGregor ahead of the winner of Max and Poirier too? Nothing, nothing. Jesus, what is the, what is denying them putting the loser of Max versus Poirier in front of the winner of Max versus Poirier? Nothing. <laughs> there is nothing preventing them from doing that. Now that seems like you might get some fan revolt at that point, but are you really going to get fan revolt if you put Conor McGregor, dude? It's whatever they feel like doing when they feel like doing it in a way that they can palatably sell to a majority of the pay-per-view or otherwise purchasing uh, uh, or product purchasing audience. That's really what it comes down to. So like if you're healthy and you're ready, yeah, it might actually be beneficial, but the second you're not, it no longer is. It is, it is as close to meaningless as, as one can get. And I will say this, if they pass up the winner of a Holloway versus Poirier to give to McGregor, then truly, Anyone defending that belt anymore, you are you are indulging a fiction that needs to stop. Mm. And sort of on that note, Dennis mentioned the being available on four weeks' notice, the no surgery, of course. You know, alluding to Colby Covington, do you see a scenario? And by the way, congrats on 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 getting the scoop. You obviously interviewed Colby Covington immediately after his uh, his interaction with Dana White in in mm. Las Vegas. Um, but do you see a scenario where he potentially doesn't get the next title shot? I know Brett Okamoto reported that he will get the next title shot. It seems like that's the case. We saw the altercation, the the back and forth he had with Ali Abdelaziz and Kamara Usman in the hotel. Ali afterwards was tweeting about Usman versus Ben Askren. Ali obviously holds a lot of power these days when it comes to you know getting his fight as the fights that they want and, and the, that he wants. Do you see a scenario where somehow Ben Askren, despite Dana White saying that he wants a Robbie Lawler rematch, ends up getting the title shot against Usman? Yeah, my only thing about the Askren versus Usman thing, the only thing preventing that is just Dana White doesn't yeah. like uh, putting Askren in those scenarios. That's the only thing really protecting him uh, or protecting Colby's shot at this point. So Woodley obviously is not going to get it, I don't think. No one's even really talking about that, nor should they. I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for Woodley's game, but the mm. way in which you lost like that, where you know you have two judges had a 50-44, you cannot run that one back, at least not immediately. Now get one win, hey, it's a different scenario. We can we can talk about it again. But in any event, so he's out. Askren looks like he's trying to figure out if he's going to fight the winner of Till versus Masvidal or he has to run it back against Lawler. One of the two is going to happen. So Colby's sitting pretty at this point. Colby's in a good spot because, by the way, 
his methods are, and I'm putting it charitably, unorthodox, you know, where you're showing up to someone's press conference and you're getting a lot of headlines for it. <laughs> Hmm. And then you're fighting over crab legs uh, in, a, in a buffet line. Like, and I realized he was somewhat attacked there. But point being is, you know, doing all that media, flying to Vegas, dude, he secured – he secured – secured's not the right word. He lobbied effectively on his own behalf, I think is what I would say. So because he did that uh, and because he was so visible and because things shook out around him, what I would say is he stands a good chance. But you're asking me, like, is it going to happen? I have no clue, boys. I have <laughs> no clue. It stands to reason by a process of elimination that he should be the next one. But if something intervenes in the interim where Usman says, I'm only fighting Askren or you know, whatever the hell happens, yeah, there's a lot of ways this could go. You're asking me, does that title he carries around mean anything at this point? Obviously not. Does Dana White's promise that it means anything? If he wants it to. These, remember, the UFC is very good about adhering to everything they put in writing, which is why everything put in writing is so affirmatively tilted towards management. But verbal promises, this is a company that breaks them all the time. Hmm. You mentioned uh, Woodley just before, Luke, and I'm wondering, first of all, I know Woodley is a guy that sometimes fans have in light, but i got to say the way he handled himself after his loss at 235 was nothing but class. I think he said all the right things. But there's always been this, uh, this this sentiment that the UFC didn't want him as champion, that Dana White didn't want him as champion. Do you think he will ever get another title shot uh, in his UFC career, or do you think the UFC in some ways are like, thank God he's not champion anymore, we can look to other guys now? I actually think it's the opposite. They And man, they really botched it. Um, here's what killed me about this. First of all, losing, okay, we still might get Woodley versus Colby, and we still might get it in a title fight because it's still possible. Like, I wouldn't rule those things out. But you've certainly created some roadblocks now, right? We, I mean, God only knows if you get it under what circumstance. Just the way everything was set up was really nice. And and they they did not handle that one correctly in my judgment. Now, maybe Colby would have won, so whatever. But here's my point about this. Man, I don't know how you guys felt, but stateside, I got to tell you, I was I was detecting a sea change. I think I really think after the Darren Till fight, a lot of fans were starting to come around to the fact that, like, yeah, this guy's pretty good. You yeah. Know, that's, yeah. He's talented. He's really talented. You know, going out there and just dusting Robbie Lawler and then having to fight Wonder Boy twice and then Maya and then this. That's that's impressive, man. That's a that's a hell of a run. And he stopped feuding with the promotion. You know, he was like, You want me to do media, I'll do media. You want me to show up, I'll show up. You want me to not complain, I'll not complain. And in the meantime, he was out there going on TMZ and doing his self promotion and uh, still working the analyst desk. Like, I just feel like he had really turned a corner with the fans. I felt like, at least publicly, he had turned a corner with the promotion, and he was cruising. If he had beaten Usman, my belief is that would have made him the second best welterweight of all time behind St. Pierre. And then could you imagine going from that to setting up the Colby fight? I mean, that would have been, you know, you go from beating your toughest competitor at that point to then fighting your biggest grudge match. He mm. was right there. He was right there. On the precipice of big money, big fights, like it's, it kind of breaks my heart that this is the moment that he lost because he put in all that sweat equity. And I don't know how much he got out of it in the end. Uh, not to say that he's the only or that UFC is only one to blame, but you get my point. So I, I, I don't think he's that far out of the race because I still think he's so good he can beat maybe everyone but Usman. You know, like he's still kind of going to be around there. So what I hope is though the clock's ticking on him. I hope he can stay healthy. I hope he can get one more, and I hope if Colby or Usman wins and Tyron wins in the interim, he can shuffle right back in because I would like to see him run it back or get the Colby fight under title implications. It's going to be interesting, especially with Askren in the division now as well. Apparently, you two need to have a bit of a conversation to see what happens. There could be a DC Can Velasquez type spot. Let me quickly ask you, while we talk about UFC 235, uh, a lot of people wondering whether Anthony Smith did the right thing or not for himself by... Uh, fighting on after that shot that John Jones landed on him. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on him fighting on? From the perspective of, you know, being a prize fighter and wanting to make as much money as possible, it's certainly not the best way to go, but from the perspective of an honorable way to go and also earning a lot of respect from fans in the UFC, it, that might have been the right decision. Where do you sort of sit on what he decided to do? Yeah, it's an interesting one, right? I um, I generally uh, basically, uh, I, I couldn't imagine anyone being objecting to the way he handled it. But I, it's just, a, it's an interesting thing to consider because 
I'm a big fan of tanking. So I don't know if you guys know what tanking is. Tanking in America. It's what the Lakers are is, doing at the moment, isn't it? No, no, they just suck. There's a difference. <laughs> uh, tanking is when you know you suck, but you probably could compete better than you are competing, but you purposely towards, you know, usually it's towards close to the end of a season. You purposely don't put out maximum effort to lower your uh, uh, ranking. And so that when the following draft comes around, you're, you put yourself – because the way the draft works is to, to uh, maintain parity in sports leagues. The, the worse you did, typically the higher your upcoming draft stock. Now, that can change, especially in American football where you can trade picks and blah, 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 blah. But, but that's how it works. So the, the, the worst teams get the better draft picks. So there's an argument about tanking. I'm actually a big believer in tanking. I know a lot of folks are like, don't do it. Like, like all the analytics suggest that not in every circumstance, but there is a, ser- a clear subset – where certain teams should absolutely do it. I think my Washington Wizards should tank. I don't know why they're out there mm. trying to compete for a playoff spot, right? So that's an example. So, like, would Smith, if he had said, oh, I'm so injured, uh, and then the whole thing ended up in a DQ, and that's a loss on Jones's record, and he had to run that back, would that have been equivalent to tanking, something I'm in favor of? Maybe. Maybe it would have. But on some level, I just think Anthony Smith was like, I'm not trying to wear a belt that I didn't win by pu- punching John's lights out or submitting him or just dominating him. I don't want to like Anthony Smith has too much character to win through malingering, which is really what that would be exaggerating an injury to the point of, um, you know, either pity or some kind of end. In this case, it would have been a belt wrapped around his waist. Um, he just, it's that's, that's not, he's not looking for that. Plus he believes in himself so much that he thinks you know, he and John are going to see each other again. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I thought, in many capacities, Smith looked particularly improved. So between his belief that he can manufacture these circumstances one more time and just the dishonorability in his own mind and his own heart about what it would mean to win that way, I, I just think he was like, I can't. I can't do that. But when it comes to sports teams, tank away. Mm, I agree with you 100%. It just would have been funny because they would have obviously done the rematch and then you know now – Anthony Smith's the A side. He's getting pay per view points. It it would have changed his mm. life in so many and ways. And he'd be guaranteed a rematch and a chance to fight John Jones again in the way true. that he would have wanted to yeah. fight him. Now, who knows? Anyway, it's yeah, it's true. I I was gonna say with John Jones, what do you sort of think is is next for him, Luke? I mean, Dana White seems pretty keen on this Tiago Santos fight. I, I was speaking to another MMA media member about this, and I I almost feel like John Jones reminds me of Demetrius Johnson in the sense that Demetrius Johnson was happy to just fight the contenders in his division even though everybody kept wanting him to move up and fight DJ and Cody and, uh, and and Dom Cruz. And he was like, no, I'm happy to fight Ray Borg. I'm happy to fight Joseph Benavides, whoever's next in line. I, I kind of feel like it's the same thing with John Jones. People like, fight DC, fight Brock Lesnar, go to heavyweight. And he's like, I'm I'm happy to just stay busy, stay active, keep making money and, and kind of, um yeah, do my thing at 205. Yeah, it's not a bad comparison. I think there's sort of two factors at play here. One is that... Uh, First, well, I won't say foremost, but certainly first in my mind is that if Kane had, pardon me, if Kane had won uh, against Nganu, that might have changed the equation where there would have been pressure to see the two big personalities and stars put together in a fight. Uh, but he didn't. He got smashed by Francis. And Francis is somebody that John could fight. It's just not a name that his name was attached to. You know, there was this intrigue about uh, John versus Brock and John versus Kane. Mm. Well, the Kane thing is out for a while now. I don't know what's going to happen with that. And with Brock, it's like that might happen, but it's also still we don't really know what the situation with that is. So it just seems to me that, like, while everybody is much more intrigued, understandably, with the challenges at heavyweight, there's no immediate fight really pressing on the horizon. There's not one name they can point to. Again, Cormier, but even he's out right now and injured and not competing. So there's just nobody out there. And so if there's nobody out there, who are you going to fight? Meanwhile, I'm not suggesting that the fights at light heavyweight are as glamorous or fun or whatever, but they're there. They're available. They're ready. He's ready. He wants to stay active. And there is something to be said for being one of these St. Pierre types or Demetrius Johnson types where it's not merely a set of contenders they put in front of you, but there are these – I treat them more as not individual ones but more as these waves. You know, mm. he beat Shogun and all these guys, and that was the first wave he had to get through. And then he had this interim period, of course, where there was a bit of his troubles. Let's assume he's passed them for the most part. Here's the next wave 
that came years later when the sport had ostensibly advanced and the guys are all younger than him now. He was younger at the time. So it's just this sort of way to say, I can over time dominate, dominate, excuse me, I can through consistency be a top performer. That is a level of, of uh, excellence, I think, in the history books that we end up respecting a lot. So why not do that now when there's no real pressing need to jump up to heavyweight, beat these guys ostensibly, and by the time that's over, heavyweight should have sorted itself out, and then he can go and make a move up there. He kind of, and I know a lot of uh, MMA fans uh, don't know much about pro wrestling, but he's kind of like Ric Flair going around the different territories and giving other <laughs> fighters the rub while he <laughs> waits for his big big match. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Luke, we really appreciate the time. And before we let you go, just quickly, Derek Lewis takes on JDS this coming weekend, both men with KO Power and Junior picked up that win in Adelaide just in December. So he's got some momentum again against Tai Tuivasa. It's a fun fight for the division, if nothing else. If you had to pick... Who would you be leaning towards in that one? You know, you you would imagine if the fight is going to go 25 minutes, but you would imagine um, JDS is the guy with the jab who can work behind it, who can do a lot of stuff. Mm. But goddamn, is there anybody who is more resilient and yeah. perseverant in fights than this guy? This guy is constantly, in Derek Lewis, up against the eight ball, constantly getting pushed around in fights. It's not the first time. There's been so many fights where he's been rocked and hurt and pushed back, and he just finds a way to come back. He does it all the time because he has huge power, and once he lands it on you, you know that, that closes the show. And so if you're not going to fight him like Cormier where you can get right up on top of him, take him down, you know, make him work and wrestle, JDS can do that. It seems unlikely. It seems like he'll fight him a, a bit like Ben Rothwell. So it'll probably look something like the Rothwell fight. The only difference is I find a moment I, – I am of the belief that Lewis is going to find a moment to connect, and I think at that point, JDS, you know, with all those wars with Kane and his war with Stipe, he, I just think his ability to take a shot has been somewhat compromised. And even if it, ha Jesus, even if it hadn't been, uh, Lewis's power is just overwhelming. So I'm expecting Lewis to get his hand raised. I'm expecting him to get beat up along the way, uh, but but in the end, I I just think that power, that trump card, he keeps doing it. I suspect he'll do it again. Mm. I'll never forget the the reaction in the media room at UFC 229 when Lewis came back and beat Volkov. Just mm. just, just a crazy reaction from everyone mm. in the room and whoever was being interviewed at the time. There you go, guys. Follow the man on Twitter, at L Thomas News for all the best. Of course, the Luke Thomas Show on Sirius XM, the MMA Beat, the MMA Hour, every Monday. That's Tuesday morning in Australia and New Zealand. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to Luke's YouTube channel and check that out. A lot of great reactions, a lot of great analysis. I know you put a ton of work into that as well, Luke. So a lot of respect to you, and thank you so much for coming back on the program. Always enjoy chatting with you. Thanks, boys. Appreciate your time. Hey, this is Tony Elkagui Ferguson, and you guys are listening to Submission Radio. Keep tuning in, guys. All right, guys. Our next guest is one of the fastest rising stars in the UFC, currently undefeated. She takes on JJ Aldrich at UFC on ESPN Plus 6 on March 23rd. She is the future, but we are lucky enough to have her on the show today. Macy Barber, welcome to Submission Radio. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on here. Ah, it's a pleasure. And we saw you were at UFC 235 this past week. And tell us, what was the whole experience like for you? It was a blast. You know, I mean, I got to be out there with a, with a teammate, Anthony Smith, um, you know, who didn't walk away with a win. But um, we're still, you know, I went out there and, and got to help support and do media out there and kind of put my feet in the water for that. And, um, yeah, overall, it's just a great experience. And, um I learned a lot and, and got to continue to train because I'm in camp. So all my coaches were out there. So being able to be in camp and, and then still travel was, was good. Does it kind of give you a, a bit of a preview of things to come, sort of the, the UFC flying you out? Well, I guess not flying you out there because you're at the PI, but kind of getting you in that media sense and, and I guess getting getting amongst everything and, and getting your name out there? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was great. It worked out perfectly just because, you know, um, had I not – um, had coaches out there, I, I wouldn't have gone to the to the media and, and done all of that. But since I had coaches out there who I needed to work with anyways, um, it just kind of worked out that I would I would do both. Um, but yeah, like I said, if I didn't have coaches out there, I probably wouldn't have been out at, at 235 and and um, and done any of the media just because I'm so close to a fight. But um, it worked out perfectly. And it was, you know, great to learn. And and start to start to be in that uh, scene. So I had a lot of fun. Mm. 
You mentioned him before. What did you think of Anthony? Obviously, he didn't get the win uh, that, this past weekend. But what did you think of his fight with John Jones? A lot of people a lot, ha- have a lot more respect for Anthony, especially for, you know, what happened with the, with the knee and him fighting on through that. Definitely. I mean, he's, he's definitely, uh, his name fits in perfectly, you know, Lionheart. Um, honestly, as far as the fight goes, it's hard for me to say, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that, because I don't know what it's like to be in that position. And I mean, there's a lot of people who, I mean, nobody wants to fight John. And so the fact that he, he stepped up and he wanted, you know, because he's going for the title and, and I can definitely see Anthony going back and fighting for the title again. Um, and, and having a better chance this time at, at figuring it out and, and taking the title because I think he, he kind of held back on what he wanted to do and and um, there were a lot of things that they worked on, uh, him and Mark, that that just didn't come out and, and you could tell that he wanted to do th- the things that he wanted to do but it just didn't come out and um, I think that if he was to go back and do the fight again and, and they were to, to do it the way they wanted to fight the fight, then... Um, he would have come out, come out victorious. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, we had we had a lot of friends sort of watching the fights with us that hadn't seen Anthony before, and as soon as they heard him talk, they were like, "Dude, he's a stand up guy. We we like this guy. He's a really nice dude." And I think that really comes across as well. Um, what's fascinating, Macy, is you've got a countdown timer on your phone for when you reach twenty three and eight months. Of course, that's the age that John Jones was when he won the title, making him the youngest champion in UFC history. When did you decide to do that? And sort of how often do you look at that timer as a bit of a reminder? Um, well, it's on my home page. So I see it every day. Uh, a lot. Like all the time. <laughs> um, I also have one that I do for like each of my fights. So as soon as I get a fight lined up, I'll also have a countdown for like the fights that I have coming up. But um, I think I decided to do that. I want to say it was about a year, a year and a half ago now. Or maybe like maybe a little less, maybe like a year. Um but yeah, it was just something that, that I just wanted to do and, and it helps me because like it, it helps me to stay motivated um, and it just kind of helps as a reminder, you know, when you go to turn on your phone and instead of going on Instagram, the first thing that you see is is your countdown for, for a goal that you've set mm. and uh, it just, kinda, you know, like a daily reminder um, and yeah, it's just something that, that I started and, and I just continue to, to keep on there, you know, every time I, I don't change phones often, but if I do, I always have to like put it back up there. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you're gunning to beat his record, and you were just at his fight this past weekend. You even recently told him over Instagram that your time is coming and you're going to crush his record. Did you get a chance to see him or talk to him at all this past weekend and talk about this time and the fact that you're gunning to be the youngest champion? Um, I did. I saw him in the back a little bit. I didn't get to talk to him because I, you know, I was coming to him from. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he just said, he he looked over when I was across the room, and he just said, you know, keep doing what you're doing, um, and, and that and that he was, you know, um, I probably can't say it word for word, but he was just like, you know, you've done a lot, and you you're you're accomplishing like great things, and um, he just said keep it up, and and yeah, I didn't really get to have much of a conversation with him, but that's what he said, and um, yeah, it was it was nice to see him. Uh, my my coach Izzy. Um, Izzy Martinez is was his wrestling coach, and so he's actually cornering me for the fight. And um, John just has a really good team around him. He's got a lot of good energy uh, around him, and um, I think that's one of the things that that makes him also a great athlete is having a great team around him. And and same thing with Anthony and like all of these all of these athletes. I mean, you you build a strong team around you, and and that's what kind of helps you stay motivated and uh, continue to progress in your career. Mm. It, it's no secret obviously that you know you're on your way to potentially being a huge star and that's that's kind of one of the goals that you've set for yourself and i guess obviously john jones being one of if not the ufc's biggest stars at the moment with all the and, and he, with all the controversies that he's had aside from that he's had an excellent and stellar run do you sort of look at his career and kind of take a lot of lessons from that uh, i guess in the way that you want to navigate your career um i try to take lessons from like every athlete uh, in terms of, of the controversy that John's had, I, I, I don't know. Um, there's athletes, I would say this about every athlete, you know, there's, there's things that I look up to them, um, for, and there's things that I, I definitely never, ever, ever want to be like, and, and that goes with everyone. And, um, I think the things that John does well 
is his ability to have the range. You know, he can he can strike from far away, he can strike from up close, he can throw his elbows, he can he combines that with his um we were talking about it today with his his preconditioning of uh strikes. So like he'll throw a front kick but then he'll throw the same kick but then it'll change into a different thing and then it'll change into something else. And then he just keeps you guessing and I think that's the biggest thing that I look up to him uh for. Uh the rest of the stuff, um I, I don't try to be like anybody else, you know. Um, but I definitely like to take pieces away from each athlete and, and try them into our our, our mm. game. Mm. You told Dana White that you'll be a bigger star than Ronda O'Connor or any other stars that he has. What was his reaction? What did he say to you when you said that? He said, keep doing what you're doing, and I believe it. Um, you know, he just said, you keep putting on performances like that, and, and I have no doubt in my mind. Um, and that was, that was cool to hear, you know. Uh, but it's true. I mean, right now, the UFC, they don't have a ton of, you know, big names aside from John. And, uh, I mean, they have a lot of big names, but they're not, they're not putting out, you know, like, for instance, like Conor McGregor. Like, if you say Conor McGregor to just about anybody in this world, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, that guy, the guy with the whiskey or the guy with, <laughs> with, with this. You know, like, mm. they understand who that is. And, and I'm not saying, you know, that that a lot of people have, have come back and they're like, well, that's putting a lot of pressure on yourself. And if the way I look at it is, if you're marketable and you're a good, um, well-spoken person, then you don't have to like, it's not a lot of pressure in terms of fighting. Sure. I have to perform and I'm going to continue to do that regardless, but also being able to rep represent myself well outside of the cage is, is another thing that I'm talking about. You know, I'm not just saying, Oh, I'm going to stay undefeated, but you know, like Rhonda and I'm going to do this and this and this. And what I mean by that is like, when I, when it goes back to the pressure is I don't feel pressure because I understand that, Everybody loses. Everybody is going to, you know, but it's how you come back from a loss. And it's um, and it's how you represent yourself. And I just feel like I fit that well in terms of being able to be a well-spoken athlete and then also be a high-level athlete who can perform and back up what they're talking about. And, and I just feel like there's there's there are a lot of athletes like that, but I definitely want to maximize my ability to do that. Well, because I, I was going to say, like, when you when you look at the recipe for becoming a star, it's it's kind of like sometimes people say, like, you never really know. It's like lightning, you know, lightning in a bottle. Like Rhonda was so dominant, but she was also a pioneer, kind of sort of brash and right. outspoken. And that's sort of what like he's obviously su successful in the cage as well. But it, it was the talk that got people's attention. What, what do you think it'll yeah. sort of be for you? Do you think it'll sort of be, I guess, your your confidence, your demeanor? I, I don't expect too much trash talking from you in the future. What, what do you think is your sort of your path to becoming that kind of star? I mean, honestly, I think it's just being myself. I went from, uh, and I'm not trying to be like, oh, I just have to be me and I'm going to be this great, fantastic, <laughs> uh, uh, successful person. But I definitely feel like I have that, you know, it just kind of comes naturally as, as I can, I can fit into molding into whatever, whatever I need to be. Um, I don't necessarily trash talk because I don't have anything against the person I'm, I'm fighting, you know, or I haven't at the moment. Um, but I'm definitely not afraid to say what I, what I feel or, or how I feel. Um, but right now it's just not necessary. You know, I haven't had to say anything to, to really get under someone's skin and I'm not going to say something just to get under someone's skin when, when there's like no point to it. You know, I mean, if we're going to fight, we're going to fight regardless. So there's no need for me to start, start saying something to, to make you want to fight me more. Like, it really doesn't matter to me in terms of that. Um, but if we're being honest, like, like some things that I thought about is, um, like, this up-and-coming fight, I mean, with J.J. Aldrich, the way I kind of look at it in my head is I've already fought two of the two of the girls in their camp. So, like, I don't have to bring it up and be like, all right, I took that girl out, I took that girl out, and now it's you. But in a way, that's kind of how I look at it. But I don't necessarily have to go out and speak that. Like, I don't feel like that's something I have to do. But it's the truth, you know. I mean, I went out and I fought um, in LFA. I fought uh, Mallory Martin, and then I fought Audrey Perkins, and now I'm fighting JJ. And then eventually, when I go back to 115, I'll fight. I'll fight Rose, you know. And that'll be one, two, three, four from the same camp. So that's kind of like a story in the back of my head. But as far as trash talking and like my the way I'm going to build my name or any of that, I think it's just the fighting. I mean, if you fight and you perform and you're someone that people want to watch then you're just going to continue to grow. You know, I went from uh, my first fight in the UFC, I got 50,000 followers almost. So wow. 
Yeah, I went from having 7,000 followers to in two days I had 47,000 followers. And <laughs> um, and I mean, that's not, you can tell me that that's not someone who's coming to be a star because I don't see very many athletes that, that go and grow 40, 50,000 followers overnight. Mm. Uh, we want to talk a little bit more about the division and your opponent, JJ. But before we do, just want to get some background info on you, Macy. When did you first start watching MMA? When did you first get into it? And were there fighters that you kind of watched before you got into the sport that you kind of enjoyed watching more than others? Absolutely. Uh, in terms of when I started watching MMA, it was probably around 2010, um, which is when I you know, really started being in the martial arts world of like sorry i'm gonna move this camera just a little bit that's all good so you, would have, you, would, you would have been around you would have been about 10 years old when you began yeah, watching yeah, about 10 years, yeah yeah roughly um so that's when i started watching it but the main person that i watched you know was or the main people that i, that I always wanted to watch like no matter what card it was i was always wanted to watch cowboy i always wanted to watch robbie i always wanted mm -hmm. to watch um you know, the, the, the fight that stands out to me was um, Roy McDonald and Robbie Lawler. That was a huge fight that I mm. wanted to watch. Um, like, those kind of fights for me, even though that's not, like, the style that I necessarily want to go for is the, the, the brawl and the fight. But that's, like, what, what I enjoyed watching. And, um, yeah, definitely, especially coming back, having Robbie fight at 235, um, I was so excited for that fight. <laughs> but, like, he's the kind of fighter and cowboy and, like, all of those guys are the people that I, I watched for the most part and I wanted to continue on with their career and, and follow along because they, they were people I did look up to in terms of uh, their style or their mentality um, when it comes to the fight. And 2010, that was such a great era. You had, you know, the, the Brock Lesnar's, the BJ Pans, the Anderson Silvers of the world around. And you even, you mentioned Cowboy, a UFC Denver. Obviously, that's another guy that you got to fight on the same card as. So it's... it's cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all happening for you. Just wondering, sort of, you, you decided not to go to college and to sort of pursue fighting full time. When did you make that decision? Did you know that from a very young age before you finished high school? Or were there, were there any other careers that you flirted with? Were we, were we close to seeing, you know, Macy Barber the doctor or Macy Barber the lawyer or anything like that? Or was it always going to be fighting? So, um, yeah, I definitely, I definitely knew that I wanted to fight right out of high school. Um, I've grown up doing martial arts my whole life. So I started when I was like three years old. And I obviously didn't didn't think that I was going to be a professional fighter then, um, and I just I, we just did it as a family a family thing and and I just loved it because of the martial arts the actual art side of it was was what I enjoyed was you know like doesn't matter how often you train or how many times you go through it you're always going to have something you can learn or something you can grow on or something like that and um, so. So like that was that's how I started, um, and just you know transitioning and I lost your question. What was your question? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, ba basically, I, I think you pretty much answered it. Just like when when did you know that you were going to be a fighter full time? Because I, I guess in America, like to not go to college, like it's it's a big decision. So I was wondering if there was if you were ever going to do. So if you ever thought about, oh maybe I'll do something else, and then in the last moment you're like, you know what, I, I will definitely be a fighter. And that's kind of, and if, if you're sort of still thinking about that decision and looking at it now going, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the decision I made. I'm definitely happy with the decision I made, but I knew I was going to be a martial arts one way or another. You know, I, I coached at a gym from 2010 until, um, November of, of this past year. Um, so I definitely knew I was going to be in the martial arts world and, and coaching was definitely something I enjoyed. Um, but while I was coaching, I also knew I wanted to fight and, and, being realistic, I mean, you can't you can't have a gym and run it and, and be successful and go after becoming a, a world champion in in MMA and be able to put both both uh, or all of your heart and soul into both of those. And so I had to make the decision of okay, am I gonna coach people or am I gonna fight? And which one do I want to do um, more? And it wasn't necessarily which one do I want to do more, but it's which one it makes more sense to go after right now. And it was fighting because, you know, as a fighter, you only have a specific window of time. And so being as young as I am, I can continue and, and grow and, and be successful in that. But then I also know that I can always go back 
to, I can always go back to coaching. You know, I, there's no like age limit for that. You don't have to have a specific, you know, um, or there's, I guess there's no time limit on that. You know, you can always go back and, and, and help other people learn and grow. Um, so that was, that was the decision I made. And, um, yeah, in terms of fighting, I think I decided I wanted to fight when I was like 14 or 15. And then I really started training hard and like 15, 16, and then I made my debut at 18. Well, I was going <laughs> to say, one, one, of, one of the other interesting things that we noticed that you spoke about recently is how you're only on a 500 cal calorie a day diet. And to anyone who knows about nutrition, that's an insanely low amount, especially for an athlete like yourself. How would you say that's sort of affected you in terms of training and your performance during your fights? Because that, that was a very interesting point that you brought up. Yeah, I was on a way low calorie diet, um, 500 calories. And then obviously that was a while ago, you know, and we, and we reversed, um, or tried to get reversed out of it. Um, it was, I'm the, I'm the person that, you know, you tell me to tell me what to eat and tell me what to do and I'm going to do it hundred percent and, and I'm not going to question you. Um, of course I should have questioned that. And now it's like everything I do now is like, I ask, they're like, eat this. I'm like, why? Well, tell me why and I'll do it, you know? So I, I'm, I'm probably the opposite side of what I was, you know, and, and, and in an extreme fashion. But, um, yeah, they put me on – I was put on a 500-calorie diet for my first cut to 115. And my body obviously responded well because before that, I wasn't on a calorie deficit. And so my body responded well. Uh, I made it. The weight cut was not fantastic, but I think it was because I was on low body fat. And then when I tried to cut the water, you know, it was not fun, obviously. But mm -hmm. um, And then the second cut got harder. The third cut got harder. Um, I missed weight in one of those times due to personal issues um, and, and things that I could not control. And then, um, and then I had another cut to 115. And that last cut to 115, which is the most recent cut, is... I walked into fight week and I had 18 pounds to cut. And so I cut 18 pounds for the last fight. And, um, again, that was a, that was not a fun water cut, but I made it and I felt, felt fine in the, in terms of performance. But the one thing I've noticed is that the more like, obviously every single time I have a cut or I have a fight, my body changes a ton. And I talked to all the girls and the female athletes in the gym and, and we're all the same way, you know, we're like, there's not one single fight that we feel like we look the same, where we feel this the same, Shale where Sutton we, and you, are listening you know, to our, body, our bodies Radio. change all the time. And um, it's it's definitely a mental battle that, you know, you're like, oh, I look heavier on this one, or I look, I have more body fat this day, or I have, or not necessarily this day, or like this fight, or, you know, my legs look bigger than, than my they did last fight, or like, those are things that we, we struggle with. But the main thing is, you know, how do I feel? And, um, how am I going to perform? And that's, that's one of the things that I've noticed is like, when I did my first cut to 115, I was super lean. Like I was super, super lean. And, um, and, and I didn't feel very great. You know, like I, I don't think that if I was to fight that fight again, and it was a tougher opponent and it was a tougher fight that I would have gone all three rounds. Like, I don't know how my performance would have been. But I was I finished in the first round, so I don't know, and I can't speak for that. But, um, but then like I had another fight when I uh, went three rounds, and I had more body fat, and I had you know I was a little bit heavier, but I felt fantastic, you know. So that's one thing that I think all of us women need to kind of get over is is a little less of like how we look, and then more so how we feel and perform. Mm. Um, that's number one, and and. Obviously, especially moving up to 125, uh, I was just talking about, I'm like, you know, I don't like the way I look all the time, but, but I feel great and my power is, fan, uh, is, is through the roof and, um, you know, it's just a process. And again, I realized that this cut, I'm still not where I want to be um, in terms of nutrition or performance or any of that, but it's definitely better than it was and it's continuing to get better. So I'm trying to look at that as a positive. And, uh, yeah, not, cuts, I, I, cuts are, they're not good and they're not, they're not fun and, and they're not ideal for us athletes, but it is the way the sport is. And, and, uh, you know, you just got to make the best of it and just kind of look at it. Like, you know, I chose this life and, 
and this is a part of it that comes with it and there could be there could be worse things to do and and it's hard to be really upset and complain about something that you chose to do so I always try to remind myself you know I chose this and you know I didn't have to do this no one's telling me I have to go out and 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 diet for 12 weeks and nobody's telling me that I have to go and run on a treadmill or or that I have to go and work out three times a day or or any of that it's I chose this life and I know the things that come with it and and if you're gonna have the the enjoyment of it you're also gonna have to go through the the sacrifice and you have to go through the the hard days and the and the tired days and all of those days to get to where you want to go so um just trying to learn to enjoy the process 100 percent, and i think that's one of the most interesting and exciting things about this fight that you're moving up to fly away against uh jj aldridge and people are curious you know what what this macy barber is going to look like when you've actually got some fuel in you um just uh, by the way we appreciate your time macy we'll let you go in just a moment but just wondering in terms of the flyweight division you've you made it clear that this is sort of a temporary thing you'll be there for about a year and then go back down to straw weight would you can like what what are the goals in this division are you just looking to stay busy and take fights and gain experience if you got a title shot in this division would you be open to it or, or are you just sort of looking at flyweight as a temporary thing before you eventually go and challenge for the title at straw weight Yes. <laughs> yes to all of that. Um, yes, this I see I see this as being temporary. Um, but I don't see it as something that I'm like, I'll never fight at one twenty five or I'll never fight for the title at one twenty five. It's more so the main reason why I did one twenty five is because I wanted to fight and fighting at one fifteen was not an option for me right now because of how bad my metabolism was. Like the way it was is that when I had my metabolism I was only burning 800 calories. So if I was 130 pounds or however many pounds and you need to put me in a deficit to get down to 115, well then you can't drop your body any lower than 800 calories because you're not going to perform. So if I wanted to fight again, I needed to be able to perform in a camp. And so if I need to be able to perform, I need to have fuel. And if I'm fueling, then I'm going to have higher calories. And if I have higher calories, then my weight's going to go up. And so, like, it did not make any sense or have any, there was literally no way that I could fight at 115 and have a cut and get down to weight. Like, I just, my body has dieted so many times that it will not respond. So, what, are you going to take from 800 calories and put me on 200 or, like, 100 <laughs> calories and, and ask me to work out? Like, it, it's just not something that I could do. And so, they're like, we need to get you back up. And if you need to get me back up, then they need to... They need to increase the calories, which is going to increase weight because your body does not just switch overnight. You know, it's taken since November, I went from being at negative 60% and now I'm at negative like 30%. So my body is only burning up oh, like 1100 calories. So we're still not where we want to be. Um, but yeah, there's, that was the only option for me is to fight at 125. And so um, that was the decision we made. And, and, Knowing that, knowing that now I'm fighting at 125, I also know that the cut and the the nutrition process is still going, and it's still going to continue to to need to be worked on. So, um, 115 is not something that I can make yet. Um, but once I get my metabolism back up, then we can start to drop it back down in the right way, um, so that I can lose the weight but keep my metabolism burning, so that I can continue to eat it, to perform but while dropping weight and that's just like, that's a slow, that's a slow turnaround, you yeah. know, um, it took me forever to get to where I'm at and now it's going to take me a while to get back to where I need to be. But it's better that I caught, we caught it now than we caught it, you know, then, then having me try to just continue to, to cut and cut and cut and, and decrease calories and, and just go through that cycle of, um, not performing well. And then, and then find out, when I'm 26, 27 years old that, you know, my hormones are so messed up that someday when I retire, I won't be able to have a family or that, you know, when I retire, I won't be able to ever turn my metabolism around because there are people that, you know, once you ruin it, you can't get it back. And so, um, I'm just happy that we got it. We're, we're figuring it out now than instead doing it later because, you know, it's, it's a pain in the butt either way, but I'd rather struggle with it right now than, then later. Mm. Well, as we look to the fight uh, against JJ and we wrap up, just quickly, Macy, what's your prediction for this fight? How do you see it playing out? 
Well, obviously, with my hand raised at the end. <laughs> uh, at the end, though, that's that's the key word, the end. I don't know when the end is going to be, you know? Um, is it going to go all three rounds? Is it going to be finished in the first? Is it going to be in the second? Is it going to be in the third? You know, I don't know. Um, you know, one of the things I like to think about is I don't know how it's going to be finished or how I'm going to win. I just know that I'm going to win. Um, and I was just talking to my coach, you know, earlier, and I was telling him, I'm like, you know, I just – it, it's it has nothing i'm not being like a ronda rousey but i'm like i just cannot picture myself losing like when i go to the picture of the fight i just don't picture myself not coming out successful and that's just a mental thing that i that i would that i do you know um but i definitely see myself coming out with my hand raised um and and hopefully it's in a dominant fashion or an entertaining one for for everyone who wants to watch um because, you know, that's that's another way to win fans is having entertaining fights. And as you guys know, I, I like to fight to, to win. I don't fight to not lose. So you can definitely prepare for me to, to go out there and, and at any time I can or any chance I, I get, I'm going to go out and try to go for the finish. Yeah, I think I think that mindset is exactly the reason why people enjoy watching your fights. Uh, there you go, guys. Macy Barber takes on JJ Aldridge on March 23rd. It's going to be March 24th here in Australia and New Zealand, of course, on UFC on ESPN Plus 6 in Nashville. A really, really stacked card, so definitely something to check out. Follow her on Twitter and Instagram, at Macy Barber. It was a really fun time getting to know you and chatting with you, Macy. Thank you so much for letting us into your home. Appreciate the time, and good luck in uh, in March 23rd. Thank you so much. I'd love to come out to Australia at some point, too. That'd be, that'd be great. <laughs> we, we'd love to have you anytime. We've got koalas and, and surf, so come down anytime, even as a guest fighter. Oh, let's do it. Awesome. Thank you Thank so you much, guys. Macy. Appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Bye. This is TJ Dillashaw, UFC champ. You listen to Submission Radio. Okay, guys. Well, this is a special treat. Our next guest is a former UFC heavyweight champion, UFC Hall of Famer, TV and movie star, an MMA icon, and most importantly, one of our favorite people to speak to on Submission Radio. It's an honor to welcome El Guapo himself, Barton, back to Submission Radio. And looking swell in that very, very nice hoodie. Cold outside today, boss. It's cold outside here. Yes, it's actually clouded, and I was going to sit outside and figure, you know, while I put my uh, put my hoodie on. My daughter walked into the place, and yes, she's wearing the same hoodie. I got ah. two, but we have two Hanzo Gracie hoodies. I don't know why. That's uh, awesome. That's awesome. What a, what a great hoodie to be in. Um, we we're going to say, Buzz, we feel honored to have you on. Really appreciate it since you're currently on, I want to say, day 35 of a 90-day detaching challenge. Uh, break it down for us. What exactly is the challenge? Uh, what sort of made you want to do it? What kind of benefits have you found so far? The benefits of okay, let me let me first tell you because I I, I opened the page because I, I I knew you you might be asking about. It. Let yeah. me let me tell you what I'm going to do. Right. So there's 90 days, and like you said, I'm day 35. Okay. Okay. So no more warm showers. It's only cold. Wow. Uh, short showers. Uh, intense exercise. That's okay. I got that. Full night sleep. I got that too. Abstain from alcohol. Abstain from desserts and sweets. Abstain from eating between meals. Abstain from soda or sweet drinks like milk and unsweetened tea are okay. No TV, movies, televised sports, no video games, no non-essential material purchases, only music that lifts you up. Only use the computer for your work, uh, for school and those kind of things. And the same with your, with your, uh, with your cell phone, of course. And then there's two fasting days that I have to do on Wednesday and on and on Fridays. And I got to tell you, like at the evening, norm normally during the day when I prepare for something, you know, let's say for the professional fights league, I prepare for all the fighters. I focus like an hour and a half. But once after the hour and a half, your, your, your mind is locked up because you did a lot of focusing. So I watch a TV show, whatever, uh, Walking Dead or whatever, something I recorded. And I go back to work. I do this back and forth. Mm -hmm. So suddenly to cut that out, I don't do that anymore. And in the evening, don't watch TV anymore. Dude, I'm having a lot of free time right now. So I'm, I'm reading a lot, I'm memorizing a lot, and I'm learning things that I always wanted to learn, I'm, uh, I'm looking into right now. So I'm loving it. My mind is much faster, like I've always been memorizing things during the day. I do this in half the time now, as I did before the 35 days. I think that no sugar also does something to the brain, I guess, I don't know. I'm, I'm just feeling really good right now. Mm. I wonder, do, do you think uh, when you go in the gym and you do your workouts, are you noticing like some kind of improvement or some some? Are you feeling better because of this detachment, combat wise? I, I, I do. I, uh, my stamina uh, increases dramatic increase dramatically. I'm also losing weight suddenly. I, I guess I'm going to go all the way back. I'm like up 204 now. You know, mm -hmm. when I was like 11, 
So, uh, but it's and it's good weight because last time I was wearing my short this weekend, a, a shirt that I had, it's a tailor-made shirt, and it fit exactly the same. I was I was I was afraid of losing weight, you know, because you, let's face it, we're getting older. And if you, when you see you look at your dad, you know, they they start slowly but surely losing weight. They start shrinking, and I go, oh no, please don't let it start right now. But if, apparently, it's only about my abs. My core actually looks better than I was fighting. So uh, I take it. I don't lose the muscle. Uh, that was a very nice verification check for me when I put on that shirt. They go, oh, wow, it's exactly the same. So, yeah, no, I'm feeling good. And I'm, I'm, I'm really my stamina. I noticed that. I, I'm getting way less tired if I take a big hike or, or I do my crazy workouts here in the backyard. Wow. See, this makes us feel even more lucky now that we know everything that comes to the challenge of the fact that you're doing the show right now, chatting with us. But I guess that's technically uh, part of work, right? Technically business. That's, that's work, yeah. Because I, I did know that some people wanted to ask me about UFC 235. Uh, yeah. I was in San Diego. I found a bar. Uh, Christina Marx was there uh, help, helping out. She's the, the boxer the, who, who fought at the Bare Knuckle Boxing yeah. Show and, and martial artist who started now prof professional boxing, she, she told me. So that was a nice surprise to see her over there. And uh, man, it was a great place. Like I, I believe they said they had like 74 TV, TVs wow. in, in the. So uh, yeah, I, I came in. I saw the last four fights only because I knew I had to talk about it this week, probably. And that's why I'll say I make an exception. I can uh -huh. watch it, and then I'm going to have to talk about. It. So yes, this is a job for me now. And a heartbroken boss. I thought we were friends, and this is a pleasure. Part of the pleasures of life, but that's okay. Well, actually, it's it's only it's 90 it's emails between it's us over the years. About for you, 35, so. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. It's it's like a tax write-off. You put it under there, so it, get the money back, but the government need, doesn't need to net it. Not really that you have 12 new cars, so it's all fine. Let's talk about UFC 235. I actually, I was downsizing in my cars also, so I'm, I'm everything is <laughs> going slowly but surely down, taking wow. less and, and, and less expensive cars, yeah? It's an important thing as well. I think, you know, you, you get older and you start realizing, mm, you know, I did all that. I drove the cars that I really wanted. And now it's time for me, you know, to to save some money and, uh, and maybe, maybe maybe give to other people who, who need it more. Mm. Mm. Well, we, we need to upsize before we can downsize. So if you're <laughs> yeah. looking to give some cars, we'll get a couple of crates here waiting to, to get, yeah. get them down to Australia. Let's talk about UFC 235, though, because... You mentioned it. There was some stuff that happened that people want to get your thoughts on. The first is that main event between John Jones and Anthony Smith. What did you think of the main event and what Jones looked like in this one? Well, Jones, Jones always looks good. You know, he, he, he did have an off day, though, I, I think. And that's what he kind of said himself also at the end. You know, he didn't because you saw he was tired still in the interview. After the fight, he was still tired. So he simply had an off day. But even on an off day... He looked really good. And sure, yes, that, you know, the knee when he was down, he was very lucky that Smith uh, didn't play the card, right? The, the DQ card. And then uh, he would have gotten the victory. So uh, that says something about him. But uh, yeah, for the rest, I mean, he looks great. If you look at him, the things that the way he throws kicks and, and everything is different. It's just an, an, a kick to the thigh and then it's a high kick and that's a front kick and that's a left leg. And it's, but, you know, he's so all over the place it's very hard to find any patterns with him and, and that's why he's so good to connect that together with his freakish athletic abilities that this guy had you know i've been saying this for a long time he could really go down to history in history as the best guy ever if he keeps his head straight you know i i liked it that he was very respectful after the fight but we all know that you know we still don't know if it really comes from the heart i do believe so because it starts slowly but surely and hopefully he's going to be that guy that all kids look up to and that they can actually relate to. And, uh, you know, and then if you behave yourself, well, that translates to those kids. And uh, he has, he simply has a lot of impact to a lot of people. And I hope he knows that so that he uh, doesn't do those crazy things anymore outside of fighting. I was just going to say, you mentioned Anthony Smith not taking the DQ. I think a lot of people expected exactly that from Anthony Smith, you know, giving, given his character, given that he's a, he's a stand up, honorable guy, but I got to say, it's kind of, and I'm not saying he should have done it, but you think about if he, he if he had taken the easy way out, he'd be champion right now and he'd be locked into a rematch with John Jones and be getting those pay-per-view points. So I I guess it sort of says a lot about him not taking that DQ, right? Yeah, no, I think so too. I think uh, it was phenomenal that he did that, you know, and, and it could have easily been a knockout. Mm. I mean, think about it. I mean, he's got a tough head. He's got a hard head. Jones said himself, himself in the interview afterwards. I mean, I hit him and he was talking to me the whole time. So the guy has a hard head. A lot of other fighters might have been knocked out, actually, on or, or days at least. 
so they couldn't continue. So, yeah, Jones was lucky there. Mm. I mean, you mentioned it before, Jones is looking good. What do you think of this Jones version 3.0 that we're seeing here? Do you think he avoids the controversy and keeps his return going and sort of keeps progressing and progressing until he eventually retires? I, I, I truly hope so. I think the only guy who can beat John Jones is John Jones himself. You know, like when something mentally happens to him in his family life or something that he makes a, a mistake, something happens drastically, not simple stuff that fans are screaming. No, something very close to him. And that can I steer him away. I, I see like a, like a Tiger Woods, you know, never lost. And then something stuff happened in his personal life that really affected him. And that, you know, he, that went on through his, to his golf game. And I, I think that is the only way for Jones to lose the fight. I think this guy is so, so good, so mentally strong and everything. So you, you, you would think nothing bothers him, but of course, people close to him that might really bother him. So I hope that he stays in line and then he just becomes, you know, fight four, five more years, six more years, you know, whatever you feel like, and then just go out as the best fighter ever. I mean, he literally has those capabilities. Mm. I, I like the comparison between him and Tiger Woods. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I also feel like he's almost like a bit of a Demetrius Johnson at the moment. Like he's just kind of taking the next challenges at 205. And people aren't really that excited about Tiago Santos necessarily. And they're saying, hey, you know, fight Brock, fight Daniel Cormier, go up to heavyweight, do all these things. Kind of like where people are saying to Demetrius Johnson, hey, you know, fight Cruz, fight uh, Garber, fight TJ. And he's like, nope, I'm, I'm happy to just continue fighting these contenders. Well, when you look at the options for John Jones, between a Tiago Santos, a, a Lesnar, a, a Cormier, who, who sort of, I guess, tickles your fancy? What would you rather see next for John Jones at the moment? I would, I would love to see him fight heavyweight. I think if you see a John Jones at 220, 225, you know, which probably is an easy thing for him to do, because I, I, I assume, I mean, when he stands next to you, he's a foot taller than me, Omar. I mean, he's a hmm. huge guy. So if he goes to heavyweight, man, with his speed and everything that he has, I, I, I think he will do really well in the heavyweight division as well. And he knows that, you know, I, I think eventually he will go there. He has to, you know, because for him, he, he's a competitor. And like you said, it's going to be, it's already very hard to find guys at 205. So a bigger challenge would be waiting for him at the, at the heavyweight. Do, do you think he'd be disadvantaged at all at heavyweight? Because like, like you said, you know, he's 6'4", he's, he's a big guy. You would think that putting on that muscle will be something that he, he could do. But when John Jones speaks about heavyweight, he kind of talks like, oh, I'm not really in a rush. And he said, I've always been a light heavyweight. That's always been my natural weight class. And I just sometimes wonder whether he genuinely means that or whether he's just trying to sort of publicly negotiate with the UFC to not seem too eager and to sort of get that extra money from them when he eventually does go to heavyweight, if he does. Yeah, I, you know, he solidifies himself at, uh, at 205. And then, you know, heavyweight, is, uh, like I said, he's walking around 225. I, I truly believe that maybe even heavier, you know. So for him not to have cut weight, I mean, can you imagine how good he's going to have to be, uh, how he's going to be? I mean, no cutting weight, no nothing. I always said it with guys who cut too much weight, you get weaker, guys. Don't do it. Stay away from it. Treat your body with respect. You're beating it up every day, two or three times a day already, you know. Give it all the food and everything that it wants. So fighting at your natural weight, which he probably is 225. Look at Mike Tyson at heavyweight at 225 or 220. Yeah. I mean, he, he fought these big guys and he, and he stopped everybody. And... And Jones does have that talent. Let's talk about quickly the Kamara Usman. Obviously, he beat Tyron Woodley to become champion. What do you think about him fighting Covington next? And we don't know if you saw this because you're detached at the moment, but Usman and his manager, Ali, actually got into a confrontation with Covington the next day in the hotel where Ali actually swung at Covington. Do you think there's such a thing as crossing the line and going a little bit too far in these kinds of confrontations? Yeah, you know, why Why would you take... I, I, I think violence is the last resort, right? You want to go to, you don't really need that. And I, I don't know, mm -hmm. maybe it's a publicity stunt, maybe it's not. I don't think so with Ali. You know, he's he's a guy, he's just an emotional guy. And if things aren't being said, he wants to take care of that right away. So this could very well be true. And it, it, it will be a fun fight to watch. Why not? I mean, just looking at a fight like that, Usman's obviously very, very talented when it comes to his wrestling. It looks like he's improving in his striking Covington is a great wrestler as well, and his striking isn't the greatest, but quite effective too. Is there a guy there that you think sort of stands out, or is it one of those fights where it really depends on the variables on the day and how, how both men feel going into that octagon to see who wins that one? It's always hard to say. You know, Usman completely blew me away. 
I, I, I had a feeling that he had a chance, but I thought, you know, he, he will pull out all the, the great things that Woodley has. You know, Woodley's a tentative fighter, but I thought if somebody's going to bring it to him, then he will bring out what he really can do. I think if, if Woodley just lets go, I think he's a very hard guy to beat. He has so much talent. You know, and then Usman coming in and just completely dominating, you know, and now being the champion and there with his daughter and everything, everybody was there. You know, you don't want to lose that anymore. So this, most of the time when you become a champion, you know, it, it goes two ways. It's either, oh, I made it. And the smart ones, a guy mm. like Usman, I truly believe it's like, okay, I got to step it up now. Even with my stamina, which is already incredible, and even with everything else, now people are really going to hunt for me. So most of the time when a guy gets a title, they don't want to lose it anymore. It makes them stronger. And hopefully that's for him the same case as uh, against when he fights uh, Covington. Mm. An incredible shape as well. Let me just quickly ask you, Woodley, he's obviously not getting the rematch. The UFC is not the biggest fan of him. But how do you assess where he ranks with his reign? Because obviously GSP and Matt Hughes are probably some of the best of all time. Then you got guys like Robbie Lawler and Johnny Hendricks in there. And then Woodley, a lot, you know, he's he's been able to do quite a lot in his run, but... I don't know, people aren't really too, a lot of fans aren't too high on him and the UFC aren't too high on him, but how do you rank his run as a champion now that it's said and done? Really high. Look look at the guys he beat. He beat some really good guys. You know, I don't know what people are talking about. And it's not only decisions either. You mm -hmm. know, he's been stopping a lot of people as well. You know, most of the time when you look at guys who are at the top and they fight the last guys, there's a lot of decisions because the level is so close together, but he was still stopping people. So... I don't know where people got. I, I understand it, and that was a frustration for me as well. And it's like with the guy with GSP as well. They have such an incredible talent that you want to see all of that talent, but some they, they don't show it, you know. And, and it's which is a very understandable thing. You're playing it safe, you know. You're the champ. You don't want to lose the title. I mean, it comes with a bigger paycheck. It comes with everything, so people can say what they want to say at home. But you know, that's just the way it is. But you know, I I, I really respect guys like also like Chuck Liddell. You know, yes, he got a bunch of times knocked out, but I guarantee you he didn't lose a single fan uh, during that because people like guys who just come out and just give it. Look at it. Cowboy Cerrone, look at this guy. And, you know, it doesn't matter winning or losing. And I prefer he always wins this guy anyway. But, I mean, he's always there to bring it. And, and if you have that talent, I say throw it out. Let it go. Take a little bit of a risk because once you do that, you become such an, a more exciting fighter that the people want to see because, yeah, now they – they start uh, booing even, and I, I, I don't get it. This guy's a freak athlete. If you're Tyron Bass, what would you sort of do if you were in his position? Because before this fight, he was talking about wanting to maybe go up to middleweight, uh, you know, because he was so dominant at 170, and then taking that middleweight title as well, potentially being a double champ. Now he doesn't have any titles, and like Dennis mentioned, you know, him and Dana White have clashed so many times. I get the sense that he may never get another title shot again, just because of his relationship with the UFC. What, what do you sort of do in that situation? I imagine in some ways it'd be kind of hard to, to I guess, be be motivated knowing that, hey, that, that title shot may not be around the corner. Well, use all that. You'll all, use all the aggravation that you have with the UFC and with all the other people and use it as fuel and just start loading up on crazy stamina and then just time the next time tell yourself, you know what, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to let my... My technique, the, the, the gifts that I have from God, let it fly. Just let it fly. And I think that once he starts doing that, he'll start knocking people out left and right. And, and, and then there's no other way. Once you do that and you start stopping people and you climb back to the spot where you need to be, there will be a title shot. It has to be because, you know, it's very simple. You start complaining. Like I had it with Pancras. You know, I, I think I won like 11 fights in a row and I still didn't get an, a title shot until I became vocal, you know, because I saw other guys doing it. And I go, you know, my might as well start doing it. I'm not that guy who likes to do it, but you know, if that's my way to get a title shot, you know, I start saying, look at them, they're champions, but they're afraid of me. They don't even, you know, and once I start saying that, of course, boom, immediately I had a title shot. So mm. that's for him the same thing. Let your technique fly, make sure you start stopping opponents and then just fight yourself back up to the top, which is going to be a very short fight, uh, a few fights only because he's already the, at the very top. And then, and, and then decide where you want to go. I don't know how much he, w he cuts for this weight. So I, I think a higher weight class would actually be better for him. But uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. What's the most interesting. But yeah, he can do it for sure. Mm. He, he could do the de detached challenge as well. It sounds like the stamina uh, could, could come just from mm. that bus. So that could be something we need to tell him about. We want to quickly get your thoughts on a couple other things happening in the MMA world. And because you have been detached, 
You might have not heard about this, but UFC 236 just around the corner and the interim titles uh, looking like they're going to be in the main and co-main. Just want to get your thoughts on Max Holloway fighting Dustin Poirier for the interim lightweight title. Apparently, Ferguson passed on the fight with Max. Are you a fan of this Max Holloway-Dustin Poirier matchup for the interim lightweight title? I'm a huge fan, and I'm, I'm torn in between because I'm a... Um... I'm a huge Holloway fan, but so I'm a used to Diamond. I'm also a big Diamond fan. You know, I love that guy. I'm following him also on Instagram. And, and the same as with Holloway. You know, Holloway, and I, I said this last time when he came into the UFC and he fought McGregor, he lost his fight. And I remember talking about it on Inside MMA. And they said, what do you think of Max Holloway? I say, well, he's going to be the next champion. And they all looked at me and they say, he just lost his fight. I say, yeah, but, you know, his age and the way he moves and the, the, the range, the distance, everything that I see with him, it's nearly perfect. So a guy like that's going to be very hard to stop. And boom, I was right. Suddenly he became the champion. And now we see what he can do against Ortega. What a fight that was. That was an insane fight. Yeah. Now we got Poirier. And, and I, I love that guy as well. He's stopping people left and right, you know. Uh, knockouts and submissions, which I like a lot. But, you know, Holloway is just a very hard guy to beat. I think uh, a, a guy like Poirier, though, might can do it way better because... He's got the takedowns, he's got the submissions, and he's got the striking as well. And once you start matching everything up, it's still then, you know, there was Ortega was the same deal. He's very good with that as well. I think Poirier might, might have maybe better takedowns than Ortega. That I don't know. But if that's the case, well, mix up great striking and then pick a right moment. But somehow um, Holloway is so, is so good at stopping the takedown and avoiding it. And uh, standing, striking... Yeah, he's a very hard guy to beat. His timing is so good and his distance is so good. He stays just outside the reach of his opponent constantly. You know, and, and he's doing those things that I said, for instance, that Woodley should do. You remember when he draw the line and he says, let's slug it out? Mm. You see, he's taking risks. He wants to do those things. And I know Poirier will immediately say, embrace that, say, okay, let's draw the line. Yeah. So I have a feeling to see that in that fight but it's a very hard fight to call let me ask you about seeing as you did sort of predict this a while ago on inside mma you, you call holloway being a champion um i know this fight isn't necessarily around the corner but holloway and mcgregor have always had that sort of little back and forth they've teased each other about the whiskey you know holloway with jameson mcgregor with proper 12 and people have always wondered with so many improvements from both guys what a rematch would look like these days who, who would you sort of lean towards, given Holloway's dominance at featherweight now coming up to light, lightweight? Who do you think would sort of have the edge if they did fight again? Both are very, very, very accurate. Both are very good. We had uh, McGregor like two weeks ago. He was training at my gym a couple of times. He came over and I saw oh, him. Oh, that's like, right. Like, yeah. Yeah, it was cool. And, 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 you know, the hitting the back and, and, and the way he kicks and the way he does everything, it's he won't miss. Like back kicks to the back, he won't miss. I mean, he's got laser guided precision. That's really good. But Holloway, you know, it's the same thing. Here, here we're going to see a fight if that happens. Even if Holloway had, had t really great takedowns and a really good submission, game, he might have, I don't know. But imagine that he would be extremely good on the ground. He's the kind of guy who's going to say, I'm not going to do that at all against McGregor. We're going to stand. I think we're going to see a boxing match with some kicks here and there uh, between them, which is going to be super excited. We're going to see the, 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 the reach advantage of McGregor if he can stay on the outside. Uh, if he can do that, because Holloway is a really great way. Oh, dude, man! Now you say that. That's a that's a <laughs> badass fight. If you think about it, you I I don't know who would win that fight. I I, I do know if it goes into the later rounds, it's probably going to go to Holloway mm, yeah. uh, because of the stamina with McGregor that he has in the past. But he knows that, and I know that he's been working hard on the stamina as well because he, the next fight, there's no way he can do that. But that has been a problem with him in the past with all the fights and especially the ones that he lost. You know, I, I, I look at the Mayweather fight. I mean, if he would have been in 100% shape, he would have gone the distance. He's going to have 10 rounds. But it's because he started getting tired, that's when Mayweather start taking over. Otherwise, I think it would have gone the distance. So, yeah, that's that will be an insane fight. I think the UFC, if they put that fight on, that's going to get a lot of numbers because I, it makes me super excited just you you throwing it at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's why I asked it because a lot of people, uh, you know, find that a fun one. Yeah, when you mentioned that, it reminded me. I saw uh, Conor McGregor put out like a long, I, I want to say it was on Instagram, put out a long post and sort of gave you a lot of credit, a lot of props, a lot of love your way. How did that come about that he ended up training at, at, at your gym? What was he doing there? Well, he, he was here for business, he said. He was staying in Malibu and I'm staying, I'm in the Westlake Village. So that's literally a 15 minute drive to my gym. So he found somebody 
uh, who knew, who also trains at my gym. And he said, well, I'm pretty sure he can train at Boss's gym. So my student called me, Zach, <laughs> and he said, hey, McGregor's going to be here at 9 o'clock. Uh, is it okay if I open for him? Because it was a Sunday and it's closed. I said, of course. I said, but, you know, give me a call if he's there. I would love to come by and let him sign it because we have this wall of fame, so to say. Mm. We have a picture of a fighter and underneath is a, is a glove, a signed glove. And I go, man, I would love to come because I want to give him, uh, I would let him sign an, uh, a, a glove. So I can put it on the wall there because that's a great name to have. And of course, my daughters, they were super excited. I, I got called, uh, I got texts in the morning, uh, texts already because I wasn't checking my social media since because of the detaching thing. But somebody sent it to me and they go like, dude, did you see what McGregor wrote about you? And I go, wow, that's so cool. And my daughter said, my boyfriend, he woke me up and he showed me the, the Instagram post. And then my other daughter, boy, uh, daughter who was in house uh, in, um, in, in town, she got it to meet him the next day because and all her friends were super jealous, of course, because let me tell you, man, in, in high school, everybody's a big Conor McGregor fan because when they found out that she was with him, people were like freaking out. She was the chick of the day, not the man, but the chick of the day. I can tell you that. I got, I got to ask, um, and we'll let you go in a moment, Bas, but what, what was Conor's, what did you gauge from Conor in terms of his mindset? Because people are sort of thinking that this Cerrone fight is next and, if this fight does come together, it's sort of a pivotal <laughs> fight for him. Some people feel like after the Khabib fight, he sort of needs that redemption. And if he doesn't get it against Cerrone, I mean, his 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 career, I think, in a lot of ways, would potentially be in trouble. What what kind of Conor did you get? Was he a sort of hungry Conor McGregor? What what was the vibe like? You know, he's always the same. And I said it to other to other people. Conor's a different guy when you see him on uh, on TV. You know, he knows exactly when to turn it on and, and how to talk. And, 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 and it's so well done. You know, all the speeches he does, it's all different. Like, I'm, I'm very boring. They, I, I prepare something that I'm going to say, and I will say that in 20 interviews. He is constantly different with everything that he does. The fact that he's here for business and still works out every single day means that, he, that he's busy and he knows what his fighting is. I, I don't know what he's going to choose. I didn't want to talk about that. I didn't want to be the guy who was going to watch him train and to be there. I just came there and said, hey, man, great to have you here. That's, uh, you know, and he, he asked about the belts. They were hanging on the wall. And I go, oh my God, that's the old UFC belt, Bob. Bob. And you remember they put the Dutch flag on it. He knew yeah. and all these things he knew. And then when I read that post, I go, wow, that was really nice of him, you know. And, and, and not only, you know, he, he really went into depth. Uh, of that so no I think he's a very smart guy there's no profanity around him around him when he's walking in the gym he's a different guy and I already said that because I interviewed him a bunch of times and he's just such a good guy uh, except when he goes on TV you know then he turns it on and he knows exactly how to make that money me personally I would think what he should do also and I don't know, I'm not making a lot of people angry here but Paul Malinaji right that's a great boxing match these two guys you know, Malinaji, he, he, apparently something happened in that training camp. He really doesn't like him. I know he's retired, but I bet you will come out for McGregor. And that's a fight which would be a good fight for McGregor. If it goes the distance, still Malinaji, because he's very technical, but he's not a powerhouse puncher that he's knocking out of at a high, with a knockout rate of 80%. So, which I think could be good. And I think that for Conor, the very first boxing match ever, professional boxing match against the guy who's 49-0 and, and then having that performance, I was pretty impressed, let me tell you that. So... No, that will be a good match for him as well. And then I would rather see him fight Max Holloway than, uh, than Cerrone. Cerrone would be a great fight too. That, that, that's the thing. And I just mentioned that already. That Those are guys who are always fights. So the, we we're always going to see a great fight. So whoever he believes uh, he wants to give the most money to, because <laughs> let's face it, that's it, right? Yep. I mean, if you face McGregor, you're going to make millions of dollars. Uh, that's that's up to McGregor, but both both those fights, I like a lot. Well, I'll tell you what, how exciting! It's like the place to be. Your your gym boss is very exciting to see that Conor McGregor gave you the props that you deserve, sir, because obviously a big icon in the sport. Uh, we'll let you go because we know you want to detach. But before we do, just quickly, um, an update for everybody on Karate Combat. I know that was a fantastic event. We didn't get a chance to. Get down there because we were in Australia, but all of our colleagues in the in the MMA media were just talking how, about how great it was. When, when's the next event coming up for that? And do you have any other updates that you want the fans to know about? Um, well, they, they they were wanted to put uh, ten events on this year, and we I I, I just a uh, Kyoto, uh, which was uh, Japan, 
that just got scrapped in the first week. But at the end of March, I still going to have to know the date because I called them actually yesterday to ask mm -hmm. if they knew the date because there's a lot of things that I they want me to do right now. And I said, man, I want to keep that date clear. But that might be go to Budapest, which is a country oh, I nice. really want to visit, man. That is so beautiful over there. So, yeah, I have the feeling that at the end of March, they're going to go to Budapest and uh, and have another show there. And, and the show here in L.A., yeah, it was insane again. And what a good people. If you talk to the the people who started it and and, and the, the fighters and the karate cards, everybody involved, they're such a such a tight knit group. And, and and what I love to see, what I love seeing about those guys is that, you know, yeah, they might get into a scuffle with each other, you know, at the way in and they start talking smack to each other. But as soon as they is break, they step back, they both bow to each other again. It's that real respectful mm -hmm. karate ka style, you know, the integrity that they have. And I, I, I just love to see that because first you think they're going to fight, but then no, they're not going to fight. They mm -hmm. bow to each other, but they're going to literally do it in the pit. The next day, normally you would say the ring. So I love the show, man. It's I'm, I'm so happy that it came to me and asked uh, me to be the ambassador for their for their brand because it's an unbelievable show and everybody involved is it's a really tight knit community, so to say. Well, there you go, guys. Make sure to follow Bass on Twitter and Instagram for all the latest updates on that. Of course, at Bass Rudin MMA. Check out his Facebook page as well. That's got a ton of great content as well. And get your Bass Rudin O2 trainer now. Get in the best shape of your life. We've spoken many times on the show about the O2 trainer. You can get it at O2trainer.com. Bass, again, I can't say it enough, man. In the, in this in this period of sort of detaching, we really appreciate you squeezing us in and uh, and chatting us. Really appreciate it. Always uh, always a fun chat. With you. you said you're boring at interviews. That's absolutely ridiculous, man. Never ever ever a dull bus written interview when you're being on the program, man. Always love it. Thank you so much. Good. You're very welcome. Thank you, guys. I always love to be on your guys' show. It's uh, it's awesome. You guys are doing a great job. Bang! And with that, that is the end of Submission Radio. Big thank you to our guests, Bas, Rutten, Luke, Thomas, and of course, Macy Barber for coming on the program for the first time. A quick shout out to the Burn. That's right, Melbourne United in the finals of the NBA, wow. NBA NBL playoffs. A shout out to those guys. Good luck in there. Just beating Andrew Bogut, who's going to be playing in the NBA now in the playoffs as well. From one one playoff series to the other. Unbelievable. Anyway, a big, a big good luck to those guys. And thank you for you guys tuning in we will be back with another episode of submission radio next week leave your comments thoughts below and we'll catch you guys next week